Rebecca Long Bailey. So obviously, um, my other job is being the MP for Salford and Eccles. And just before the budget, I had a chat with a number of my constituents because we'd heard that Philip Hammond was about to paint quite a rosy picture about how fantastically the economy was doing. And I wanted to find out whether that was the feeling on the ground in Salford and Eccles. So I spoke to a number of people and categorically the answer was no. The situation hadn't improved in our community. In fact, it had got dramatically worse. Um, I had a lady in her 60s talking about how angry she was about having put so much into you know, the economy throughout her working life and she felt that the rug was being pulled from under her because there would be no social care for her when she needed it because of the social care crisis. I had younger people talking to me about the complete decimation of industry in Salford. We, you know, obviously we're un not unlike Newcastle and parts of the North East. We saw a lot of our industry taken away in the early 80s and there was very little brought back to replace that. And the jobs hadn't been uh, brought back to the community and people were angry about that. And unfortunately, we had a whole new generation of people that were younger than myself who didn't really understand why they were in the economic situation that they were and they didn't didn't realize that all of this actually started in the early 80s. So the answer was no. The situation hadn't improved for people in Salford. It was actually getting a lot worse. Now, if you plot the gross domestic product of the country over the last two centuries, it would look like the side of a mountain. It would head upwards, but in a jagged way. Now, this is because the movements of GDP can be broken down into two parts. Now, the first is what they call the long run trend and the general tendency for GDP to increase, like the side of a mountain going upwards. And the second component is the business cycle the small fluctuations around the long-term trend, the fact that GDP can jump up one minute, and that's what we call a boom, and it can crash the next, and that's what we call a recession. Now, they're the jagged edges of the mountain. Now, industrial strategy is concerned with the former, the long-run upward trajectory of gross domestic product. The principal and traditional question of industrial strategy is to ask what economic arrangements are necessary to make sure that our mountain keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, we need a much more expansive understanding of industrial strategy to answer that question. But for too long, economic policy has been preoccupied with the rate of growth, and it actually paid very little attention to, firstly, what growth actually looked like, Secondly, how the benefits were actually distributed. And thirdly, the environmental impact of our economy. So if we look at the first question, what economic arrangements are necessary to ensure that our long run growth is sustained and it increases? Well, over the last three to four decades, the answer to this question was to unfetter markets as much as possible and leave them to their own devices. Now, I have this long-running joke that I can't do any speech without having a rant about Maggie Thatcher, and this one is going to be no different. And Ronald Reagan is also uh, a villain of this piece as well. A lot of people might remember in the early 80s, Maggie Thatcher running around with a book by an economist called Hayek called The Road to Serfdom, and she waved it around as if it was some sort of economic Bible. And essentially, um, the, the principles within that related to light up supervision of our financial sector, and it meant deregulating many markets and the withdrawal of government support to industry uh, and the economy at large. And it also involved the principle that, you know, industries could be outsourced and, and put, sent overseas to cheaper labour markets. And we were told that there would be this trickle down, that it was OK, because even though we were all being made redundant now, something would come in time to fill its place. Well, we know how that happened. We didn't really experience an economic miracle, certainly not where I lived and certainly not here in the Northeast. Now, we can look at the statistics to prove that this economic model failed. The average annual growth of GDP over the period from 1950 to 1973 was about 3%. In contrast, the period from the mid-70s to the late 1990s, which witnessed the application of uh, the most kind of like liberal market doctrines, witnessed a rate of growth of just over 2%. 
So if we look at growth also on a per capita basis, from 1950 to 1973, it was 2.5%, and from 1973 to the late 1990s, it was 2% per annum. So clearly the project wasn't working. However, they still drove ahead with this project, and unfortunately, the current government that we have in place, knowing that the project doesn't work and it's not economically credible, is still proceeding along the same agenda. Now, very worrying for Britain's future prosperity has been our recent productivity performance. I'm sure you've heard a lot about that, and uh, the fact that relative to our European counterparts, we're doing very, very badly. Now, productivity is an indicator of how much output our workforce can produce per person. Its growth is the basis of prosperity, as a given workforce can produce more goods and services, the more productive it becomes. So German workers are producing a lot more compared to UK workers, and that's not any measure of, uh, of the, the actual kind of like work ethic of our UK workers, it's the fact that German industry has had a lot of investment, which means that they're a lot more productive. Now, if you look at output per hour in the UK, it was 18 percentage points below the average for the major G7 economies in 2014. Now, that's the widest gap since records began. France has got a productivity which was around 30% higher than the UK's, and Germany is 35%. Now, it's clear, as I've said, that Germany invested, it had a, a, a manufacturing renaissance, shall we say, and this has paid off for them, whereas our government took a completely different approach, proceeded along the basis of austerity, didn't provide industry with the support that it deserved, and hence we have the productivity gap today. So even on its own terms, then, the old model, which I've spoke about, which attempted to revive the doctrines of classic liberalism, simply hadn't produced the growth that its proponents had claimed it would do in the 1970s. So what about our more expansive questions, then? Have the proceeds of that growth been fairly shared? Well, the answer, I think, you know, is no to that question. One of the striking features, I think, over the last 30 to 40 years has been the rise in inequality. The Gini coefficient, which is one measure of inequality, um, where zero represents the national income being divided equally between everybody, and one representing all income being concentrated in the hands of one person. The Gini coefficient shot up dramatically between the late 1970s and the early 90s, from 0.43 to 0.53. <laughs> and it currently stands at around 0.5. And we know that the distance between the rich and poor is greater now than it was in the third quarter of the 20th century. In, in fact, people in Salford tell me that it actually feels that inequality is worse now than it was in the Victorian era. And that's a pretty uh, horrific statement to make. Now, inequality has also got a regional dimension. Where we are today in the north northeast, the GVA per head is 18,927, whereas in the southeast, it's 27,847, and in London, it's 43,629. Now, there are enormous discrepancies in income, so clearly something isn't right. Now, these inequalities have created a more divided society. And we saw this, I think, in the vote to leave the European Union. I was frightened when I was knocking on doors in Salford when I heard how angry people were. And we saw the, the creation of a race-related hornet's nest by certain campaigns that were trying to point the finger at you know, certain groups that weren't responsible, quite frankly, for the economic situation that we find ourselves in. And people in Salford were angry that they couldn't get access to GP appointments, that their local authority had had its funding absolutely slashed to the bare bones so that even our bins don't get collected regularly enough. People were angry that they weren't going to get the social care that they deserved. And people were angry that, you know, we had a lot of war veterans living in Salford. There were people coming back from war who'd put their lives on the line and they weren't getting this support or the recognition that they deserved. But instead of blaming the government for this, unfortunately, people were encouraged to blame other people for this. And then we saw the referendum result, and we saw that dramatically it was often in areas that had had higher rates of inequality, poverty and deindustrialization, who voted on the whole to leave. And I think that was to register their frustration at a political and economic system which was not recognizing them, not recognizing their community and its needs. 
So if the growth hasn't been shared equally, then what about the quality of the growth? Well, again here, the old orthodoxy comes up short because much of it was unstable and based on financial services in London and the South East. And after the financial crash of 2008, it's clear that we can't have a single sector approach to our economy. Now, the orthodoxy is also lacking on its record for the environment because whilst progress has been made, much remains to be done and we feel at the moment as if we're going backwards climate change continues to loom large both at home and abroad with massive arctic melts and reports that 85 percent of the great barrier reef has been severely damaged already and after recent flooding events which are increasing in magnitude even sulfur's on flood alert today because of the increasing uh, rain that we're having in the region the frequency of people in the north east particularly will know about the impacts of climate change more than most. Now the government is set to miss its own self-determined climate change targets and it's actually been removing support for industrial sectors that are promoting renewable energy such as the solar sector. You know we saw the, the terrible situation in the last autumn statement where they were imposing a tax on solar um, industries for example. In this budget we'd actually encourage them with the whole business rates debacle to exempt certain classes of plant and machinery so that businesses and institutions were encouraged to put solar panels on the roofs of their, their buildings. It was quite simple. It wouldn't have cost the exchequer a penny and they refused to do it. So it's clear that they've got no dedication at all to promoting the renewable sector. But this can't continue because our future's at stake. So how would Labour answer these questions and what economic arrangements would foster not only long-term growth but the growth that is fairly shared of a kind that is sustainable economically and environmentally? Well, you may, might be aware, and Chi might have mentioned this this morning, but we've had an industrial strategy consultation within the Labour Party, and we've just closed it, and we had 1,300 responses to that consultation. Exciting responses, and I'm currently going through them all at the moment with the rest of the team, and we're going to put them all together in a summarised form and then share them with yourselves, with the trade union movement and with businesses so that we can formulate a bold and exciting radical strategy going forward. But let me try to sketch the outline of the picture that we've been building so far. So Labour's industrial strategy will firstly tackle the underlying productivity problem in the UK. We're going to help support growth, but we're actually going to give businesses the tools to succeed. Because contrary to, to public perception, there's this myth that the Conservative Party are the party of business, and nothing could be further from the truth. And we saw that from this week's, well, last week's budget. We saw them attack the self-employed with a national insurance contributions debacle. We saw them not give businesses the support that they deserve through business rates. And we know that businesses all up and down the country now certain businesses I should say not all but certain businesses are sitting on capital assets and they're not investing those because the government hasn't outlined a vision of where its own industrial strategy is going to go it hasn't provided them with the fertile business environment the infrastructure that they need to succeed and make those long-term investment decisions so we've got to get away from this this myth and we've also got to start pushing forward the vision that business and government and communities have to work together and form a partnership if we're going to have any form of a sustainable and a, sust a, a, and a fruitful industrial strategy going forward. So many of the industrial strengths across the country are, are located in the regions, but uh, particularly here in the north, and I'm a bit biased obviously because I'm a northern MP myself, but we do have uh, a vast array of strengths already, and one of them is advanced manufacturing in aerospace, in automotives, in new materials. Over a quarter of UK manufacturing actually comes from the north. And here in the northeast, we know that the automotive sector are a particularly strong area. The Nissan plant is the most productive car factory in the UK. And it's testament to the excellence and efficiency of the workforce here. And there are other strengths that we've got here in the north. Digital is one. As a whole, the north digital sector produces £10 billion worth of GVA and employs almost 300,000 people. 
There are strengths in computer programming, data analytics, software engineering, technologies in the Internet of Things. Renewables, pharmaceuticals, life sciences and education is also huge. And we've also got a vast array of academic institutions such as universities that are world leaders in research, world leaders in their specific academic areas. And to boost productivity, we've got to make the most of these regional assets. As we've heard from Ted and the points that he made, we've got to link them together and formulate a local and a national vision. But that requires investment. We can't expect those institutions and businesses and community groups to take those risks on their own because they can't. We need to invest in skills. We've got to invest in capital and technology. And as I've said, it's a partnership between government, the community and business, and that needs to be fostered and supported. But at present, it's only the Labour Party that's prepared to put the resources required for investment sufficient to transform the economic fortunes of the North and the UK at large. We've planned to invest an additional £250 billion in capital expenditure projects over the next 10 years, matched by an equivalent amount done through the National Investment Bank and regional investment banks. Because one of the many issues that I certainly hear of from time to time is the fact that local groups, cooperatives and businesses simply can't get access to local finance. So we're working very hard to develop a vision that will support businesses and support those groups to fly, as it were. Now, we'd also invest in R&D, infrastructure projects, for example, to better connect the towns, cities and villages of the north. As John mentioned at our uh, Liverpool Economic Conference, there's no point just having HS2 so that you can get very quickly down to London, whilst our regions are absolutely starved of transport investment. If we're really going to build the so-called northern powerhouse, we've got to build the roads and railways to connect the towns and cities so that we can get there quickly and that businesses will see that and they will invest they will be given the uh, the excitement and the confidence to do that we'd also do um, what I like to term industrial patriotism we would champion our British businesses we would use procurement to strengthen our domestic businesses especially SMEs all the way up the supply chain through our government contracts We'd hope to crowd in and attract private investment, patient capital and create a healthy business culture, a long-term business culture, quite frankly, which is in complete um, juxtaposition to what we've seen recently from the likes of Philip Green and BHS with his short-term asset stripping. We want businesses to set themselves up for the long term, to give people jobs for life so that they have lifelong security and they can see where the future of our country is going. There also has to be a programme to invest in skills, in the human capital element, as it were. And we heard from Philip Hammond last week that he was going to invest £500 million in so-called technical A-levels. Now, that's, that's fine. We've been talking about investment in technical skills for quite some time. But what he failed to tell you was that he'd already cut £1.36 billion from the adult skills budget. So whilst they might be given with one hand, they've actually taken away more with the other. We won't be doing that. We will be investing heavily in our educational sector because we want to create the high-skilled, high-paid jobs of the future. And when you go to the general election polling booths in 2020, we want you to know the kinds of jobs that your children are going to have. We want people to get excited about that, and we want them to know that they're going to be high-paid, high-skilled jobs, as I've said. Now, we do recognise that industrial strategy has to be implemented locally and devolved decision makers are much closer to local business and the regional economy and they're much more capable of taking wise and coordinated investment decisions. Now, there's a number of uh, options that we've been examining and I'm sure you've discussed them in your many groups of so the Preston Models one, the fantastic one that we're looking at very closely at the moment. And, and it's about trying to encourage and empower our local communities to do things for themselves, quite frankly. And they can do that now. I think in a lot of our Labour-run authorities now, we need to be driving forward with an agenda that empowers local authorities and encourages them to develop community-led initiatives in things such as energy. So we'll keep you posted on the details of that in due course, but there's a lot of work going on. 
We're also looking at business supports. As I said earlier, there are too many SMEs particularly that are struggling to get access to finance, they're struggling to get access to support, and there doesn't seem to be a one-size-fits-all structure that the government is implementing across the UK. We've got good at local enterprise partnerships and bad local enterprise partnerships, and it seems to be a very chaotic system that's currently in place that's akin to the Wild West. Some are getting funding, some aren't. They're not linking in very well with each other, and we need a national and local industrial strategy. We don't want regions competing against each other for the same thing. We all want to make sure that we can maximise our potential as a country as well as possible. We're also exploring possibilities for giving workers more say in how companies are run. And we've uh, already spoke about the introduction of workers on boards, and we're also looking at uh, introducing similar uh, laws to include the opportunity for workers to buy a company if it's in the process of being sold to empower them even more. We're reviewing corporate governance as a whole to create a level playing field for both businesses and in terms of the way workers are treated because as I've said we don't want any more short termism in the form of Philip Green. We don't want to see employers like Sports Direct being able to exploit their workers on exploitative zero hours contracts. We want a fair and moral system where workers and businesses can thrive. Now, what are the other plank in industrial strategy then, environmental sustainability? Well, we've been working very closely with the leading economist, Mariana Mazzucato, to develop a mission-orientated policy, one that rallies the national resources that we've got to meet measurable and time-limited accomplishments. And our first mission, which we announced not so long ago, was on climate change. And that was to ensure that 60% of our energy comes from low carbon and renewable sources by 2030. Now, this is going to be achieved through many avenues. It's one of our commitments to public investment and developing an advanced research energy project, which is modelled on the ARPA-AE in the USA, which nurtures internationally competitive renewable industries and tackling climate change, quite frankly. It's going to save our communities money, it's going to generate jobs, and it's going to generate prosperity. Now, other countries around the world have already cottoned on to this. Germany has been investing mass sums in terms of research and development into its renewable energy sector, and we need to get ahead of the game as well, because it's at the heart of the fourth industrial revolution. So that's just one mission, and as our strategy develops, we're going to announce more, because we don't just want to tinker about with the sides here. We want to deliver a bold and radical industrial vision that will change the shape of our economy and will make people realise that voting Labour isn't just going to change a few things, it'll actually change your life. Now, in terms of... Brexit then. Now, Brexit's the big issue at the moment, and it seems to be the one that takes up most of my time as uh, Shadow Business Secretary. And a powerful industrial strategy is needed more than ever, really, in light of the risks that we've seen posed through Brexit. We need to make sure that the UK remains an attractive place for people to do business and to invest, and our policy certainly would do that. But threats to turn us into a tax haven, which is what Philip Hammond has suggested, won't make us competitive. It's only investment in skills, infrastructure and research and development that will make us truly competitive. Now, we welcomed the assurances that the government gave to the Nissan plant particularly. We said that it was insufficient, though. We wanted to see a lot more. We still actually haven't seen the letter that they, uh, they drafted. We've just heard a couple of snippets of information as to what might be in that letter. But we need the government to provide assurances to other manufacturers because it's not acceptable, quite frankly, to go ahead on somewhat of a crisis-led and haphazard industrial approach where you're offering deals to one manufacturer and not offering deals to another. And we saw that with the Vauxhall Opal PSA takeover recently. We were frightened that those car plants were potentially going to be shut down because they weren't being given the same support that Nissan had been given. And despite asking the government time and time again to confirm what support they had offered PSA, they still haven't clarified anything. Now, we've told them that we need assurances that the government is going to invest in reshoring supply chains involved in British industry in the event that everything goes wrong and we don't get 
access to the single market. We have to plan for this uh, situation. We've asked the government to confirm that they realise the risk to British industry in leaving the single market and that they will do all they possibly can to try and assure that we have unencumbered access to the single market. But again, they haven't confirmed that. We've asked them to invest in research and development so that we can be at the forefront of technology and all we get so far are wishy-washy responses, little snippets of funding here and there, re-announcements of, of amounts that they've referred to in previous budgets, but nothing exciting, nothing to get businesses or industry excited or feel secure about the future. And we've asked them to invest in skills but as I've said, they've not done that to any great length. They took away more than they've given. Now, we've finished our wide-ranging consultation, and we hope to tackle the wider issues, as I've said. We're going to bring in the expert policy advice from trade unions, businesses, academics, and yourselves, and it'll build upon the work that we've already carried out so far. Because we want to build a vision of a future Britain that leads the world in industry, doesn't just try to keep up with our competitors, leads the world in industry. We want to build a strategy that's far more expansive and imaginative than anything we've ever seen before. A situation that seeks economic arrangements that don't just sustain and increase growth, but they do so in a way that shares out the proceeds of wealth fairly and makes sure that that kind of growth is sustainable environmentally. Now, when I was a little girl in Salford, my dad used to work um, down at Salford Docks. We had a, a big manufacturing kind of area down there called Trafford Park. And uh, when I was little, I remember one Sunday, he took me out for a walk and he said, oh, let's go fishing and we'll go and have a walk up the Manchester Ship Canal. But he wasn't really taking me out for a walk to go fishing. He was taking me out for a walk to show me where we lived and what was around me. And as we walked up and down the Manchester Ship Canal and he pointed out the different factories that were there and he said, this factory does this, this factory's cousins and they make this, and this factory does that and they ship to such and such. He seemed to have a vast uh, array of uh, information and experience about all of the industries that were there and how it explained to me how that they led the world. And he said to me this, he said, Rebecca, be proud of where you're from and what we make here because it's the best in the world and I didn't even think about it then because this was the early 80s and at that time I don't think people realized how bad things were going to get but in Labour's vision going forward we will be the best in the world we will make the best in the world and my dad will be right once again thanks very much Becky Long Bailey thanks a lot Thanks for coming today. I hope you found it informative, but more importantly, I hope you felt you've been engaged in a process that will develop the policies that we will not just campaign upon and be elected upon, but will implement in detail when we go into government. We will transform the society. We will transform the society. We'll make it fairer, more democratic, more equal. But we'll only do that if we can win elections. Now, we're behind in the polls at the moment. And it's tough, it's tough. The whole of the establishment are coming at us. The media, they're throwing all their powerful resources against us. And as we said before, you know why. It's because we're trying to ensure that there's a redistribution of wealth and power within our society. So those who have the wealth and power are not going to give that up easily, are they? So that's why they're coming at us at the moment. And the way that we can transform that, the way that we can turn that, is if we all recognize our own individual responsibilities to be advocates for that change. And the ideas that you've heard today and the ideas that you've contributed today are the ones that will be able to convince people that yes, and that slogan that we've all campaigned on over the years, that another world is possible. And these ideas will contribute, they'll lay the foundations for that different world under the life of a Labour government. In the first term of a Labour government, we will lay the foundations for that new society. So we all have to recognise our responsibilities 
as advocates of those policies. And I always say it needs a lot of determination, sometimes a lot of courage as well, because sometimes you're swimming against the stream and you have to argue your case. And it's that Tony Benn thing, isn't it? You know, first of all, they think you're balmy when you raise an idea. Then they begin to accept it, and then they claim it was them that thought of it in the first place. <laughs> and that's the process we're, we're going through now. So it does require determination in this coming period. It's difficult. A lot of courage. But I always say, isn't it, the one thing that we need more than everything, anything, it's what we learned here, in this area, in that first stages of the Industrial Revolution. We put it, it was a secret. And we put it on our banners. It was unity is strength. Injury to one is an injury to all. In Latin America, they turned that into the workers united will never be defeated. That secret that carried us through as a movement and will carry us through now to victory in the next election is solidarity. Solidarity, and thanks for coming today.